warm welcome to each and every one of you. Our text today is Hebrews chapter 13, verse 14. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. And of course, the writer to Hebrews is talking about this world being the place where we as Christians have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come, which is the heavenly Jerusalem. If you are a true born again Christian and your mind is renewed by the great principles of the word of God, you will know that earth is not your home, but you are a citizen of heaven. Jesus himself said, my kingdom is not of this world. Our citizenship in heaven is secured the moment we are reborn spiritually by receiving Jesus as our Saviour. Once we receive him as our Saviour, accepting that he died upon the cross for our sins, he rose again from the dead, ascended to heaven, sent the Holy Spirit, and that one day he is coming back again. Once we have received him as Saviour, and we understand that to be true, then we need to learn how to walk with him as Lord in this life. Jesus said you cannot see or enter his kingdom unless he makes you spiritually alive and born again is the phrase that he used. The Apostle Paul wrote this, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. And elsewhere he wrote this, Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. And this principle is found throughout the Bible, Old and New Testament. For we have no continuing city, but we are but we seek the one to come. Why was the letter to the Hebrews written? It was written sometime between AD 64 to 69. The infamous Emperor Nero was the Emperor of Rome at that time. His reign over the Roman Empire was characterized by political turmoil, economic instability and widespread social unrest. In AD 64, he made Christians the scapegoats for Rome's problems. He blamed them for starting the fire that destroyed large parts of the city of Rome, and he started a brutal persecution of all Christians. I need not repeat the atrocities committed here, but they are well documented and it was an absolutely brutal persecution against Christians. They lost their citizenship of Rome, they were thrown to wild beasts and terrible things were happening to them. And Christianity was made an illegal religion throughout the Roman Empire. Judaism was still legal. So many Christians reasoned that, but we worship the same God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob still. It's just that many of our Jewish brethren do not recognise Jesus as the Messiah. And as Judaism was still a legal religion, some of these Christians figured if we go back to the synagogue, we can still prove we are worshipping God legally and therefore we can escape this terrible persecution. The trouble was the synagogue said to them, we don't want you back unless you deny that Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah. You have to stand before the congregation of the synagogue and say that he was a sinner. His death on the cross was for his own sins and crimes and he died a shameful death. Not for us, but because of what he himself did. His death on the cross was that of a criminal and there is nothing holy about his blood. And on that condition, if these Jewish Christians went back to the synagogue 
and they denied Jesus Christ, they were allowed back in to the fellowship of the synagogue. It's one of the reasons why the writer to the Hebrews makes statements such as this, of how much worse punishment do you suppose would he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? And so Hebrews was written to remind these Jewish Christians of the superiority of Jesus Christ, that he was greater than any angel, he was greater than Moses, Joshua, or any leader that God had raised up in the past, that God had sent Jesus as the incarnation of himself to die for the sins of humanity. That Jesus was a greater high priest than Melchizedek, Aaron, and all the other high priests who had to offer repeated sacrifices for sins, but Jesus only had to offer himself once for all time to shed his blood for the sins of those who have faith in him. So the writer to the Hebrews is arguing, if you go back to the synagogue, if you go back to the old way of doing things, you're going back to a system that no longer works, that is no longer functional because in Jesus alone you have salvation and the forgiveness of sins. So Hebrews was written to warn them not to go back to the inferior covenant now nullified but to realize the great treasure, the great future, the great hope they had in Jesus Christ. It's why in the 11th chapter and elsewhere in that letter they are reminded of the great men and women of faith in the past. Those who through their faith and faithfulness to God brought righteousness into the earth. Righteousness being having a right relationship with God and showing people what it means to have a right relationship with God. And that a right relationship with God would enable right living before him so that we can walk in his ways, in his paths and in his purposes. And he reminds them that these people by faith, they subdued kingdoms, they stopped the mouths of lions, they quenched the flames, they endured mockery, persecution, and theft of their earthly possessions. They were made homeless quite often in this world, but they had something much better waiting for them. And it was that which should be their motivation, even during times of terrible persecution that they were experiencing. That's why in Hebrews 11, 13 to 16, it says, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland, and truly if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country, Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. They are told a city is prepared for them. Remember our text, for here we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. The Bible is human history from God's perspective. In Genesis chapter 1 to 2, we see how redemption is not needed because humanity is living in peace and in fellowship with God. We see from Genesis 3 to 11 how sin comes into the picture and humanity's relationship with God is broken. Human civilization rises up. It becomes a godless, evil world. And the city of Babel, which is mentioned in those chapters, we see how humanity united in its rebellion against the God who had created them. And so we see how redemption was suddenly needed. And so from Genesis 12 all the way to Malachi and the Old Testament, we see that God promised redemption. That God starts to reintroduce himself to the human race and one day he promises that he himself will come and save us from ourselves and from our sins. And that is when we see the Gospels, when redemption happened through Jesus Christ, when God became carnate, incarnate, 
in this world. When God walked among us, when Jesus walked in the flesh, when he died upon the cross for us and rose again and ascended to heaven and sent the Holy Spirit, we see how that redemption happened. And in the book of Acts, we see how this redemption message began to spread. And in the epistles, the letters of the New Testament, we see how this great redemption is explained, as it's being explained here in the letter to the Hebrews. And in the book of Revelation, we see how that redemption is finally fulfilled. And I'm not going to go into it today, but we see that everything that went wrong in the fall of humanity, in those first chapters of Genesis, God puts right in the book of Revelation. The Apostle John sees this in his heavenly vision. And his vision ends with a vision of the city of God, the new Jerusalem, coming down to the earth to dwell with people again, coming down to a newly recreated earth and creation, a new heaven and earth. And it is this city, the writer to Hebrews is reminding them of, for we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. Just think about human cities for a moment. The first city mentioned in the Bible is built by Cain, a man who was a murderer, who murdered his own brother, a selfish man who committed that deed because his offering to God was rejected. Cain was a self-centered man, not a God-centered man. Think of great cities past and present, the city of Sodom, the city of Babylon, Nineveh, Carthage, Rome, Paris, London, New York. All cities past and present are expressions of one thing, human failure to build a perfect place in which to live. Many people in the past and also the present have dreams of utopia. Philosoph philosophers of the past dreamed of utopia. We can think of Plato's famous Republic or Socrates' famous city, but even they realised that human nature would never make their dream possible because you could create the perfect society, but there was something fundamentally wrong with human nature that would cause it ultimately to fail. When you think today of cryogenics, which is the process of preserving biological tissue long-term by freezing it, a lot of the rich and powerful today, they are putting their bodies when they die into this process of being frozen in the hope that one day they will be reanimated and will be able to live permanently in this world. I don't want that and they won't get it because their soul has already left the body, their fate is already decided. The Bible talks about resurrection, not reanimation. reanimation. I would not want to live forever in this failed world where evil death and suffering would forever be and where human nature was fundamentally flawed where people were self-centered and not god-centered who would want to live forever in such a world the bible tells us we are looking forward to something much better death to self not the destruction of self we are looking forward to that city that God has promised and our citizenship even now right now if we are Christians following Christ our citizenship is there and when we leave this world which we are only temporary visitors here for the duration of our lives when we leave it we have a permanent home in heaven a home that Jesus himself said to his disciples I am going there to prepare a place for you and one day he will come to be with me where I am. That is the promise we have in Jesus Christ. A continuing city, the one to come. That is what I seek and that is what we as Christians should be seeking. When I see the rider upon the proud horse, the one whose name the Bible says is death, galloping towards me in my final moments, I am going to smile 
and say, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Because I know what Jesus Christ has done for me. I know what he has done for the redeemed people of God. And therefore we need not fear death, but we need to be faithful to everything that God has done for us through Jesus Christ. I know where I am going. Do you? The people of faith, the Bible says, are not citizens of this world. That doesn't mean to say we don't have citizens of the country we were born into, or even in some cases emigrated to. That's not what it's talking about. I have British citizenship because I was born here, but I am not a citizen of this world system. I am a citizen of the kingdom of God. You cannot take your possessions with you into the next life. Look at the Egyptian pharaohs. They put great treasures in their tombs to help them in the next life. But they were still there at future times when various people dug them up and discovered them and took them for themselves. Jesus said, do not seek that which is corrupting and is rusting and that will ultimately disappear in this world, but seek the true treasure of the kingdom of God. The Bible is very clear that there are no human solutions to the human dilemma. Sin deceives, sin enslaves, sin destroys. This earth has been raped, robbed, torn, filled with anger. It's full of revenge, grief, hurt, pain, sin and death. And Jesus Christ was and is the only solution for that human dilemma. He is the one who can change our nature to give us spiritual rebirth, to become born again so that we can both see and enter his kingdom and then he begins the process when we receive him as savior he begins the process of when we can see the kingdom of god and we go no we're going to enter it he begins the process of helping us to walk with him as lord where he starts to change us from being self-focused into being god focused when asked a question about the greatest commandment this was the reply of jesus jesus said to him you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So loving God first makes the other two possible. Loving your neighbour and also loving yourself not loving yourself in a vain, narcissistic sense, but realizing that you are created in the image of God, and so is your neighbor. And that's why Jesus taught the golden rule that don't do anything to anybody else that you wouldn't want them doing to you. This is the way to live that Jesus said. And wouldn't that make human civilization and human society so much better if all citizens of whatever nation lived like that, we love God. We recognize that we ourselves are created in the image of God and so is our neighbor. So therefore, I'm not gonna do anything to you, my neighbor, that I wouldn't want you doing to me. We would have a lot more peace, a lot more contentment, a lot more happiness. But these things do not exist in our civilizations because there is something deeply flawed about human nature and Jesus Christ is the only one who can fix that. So having this focus that we are seeking a city that is to come, it does not mean we turn our backs on the responsibilities we have in this world. We have a mission and a commission to complete. We have a destiny, we have a gospel to preach, we have a great work to do. And we do that, we serve Jesus Christ in this world, preaching the gospel, seeking to live lives that are God-focused, not self-focused, seeking to help others who are created in the image of God, recognizing that God values them like he values us, but recognizing without Jesus Christ, there is no hope for them. And so therefore we serve 
Christ in word and deed as we seek to make this great gospel of his known. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. Seek what Jesus said to seek, that is that which is everlasting, not that which is temporary, and one day will all fade into nothingness. Seek that which will endure for eternity. Seek God through Jesus Christ. Amen.
Would you like to say together with me the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Lord, may your people know that their citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await the return of Jesus Christ from heaven. So that along with all of those waiting now in your kingdom, those who have not yet fully inherited everything that has been promised, we your Christians, we your saints, together with them, will inherit that city which is promised in your word. That city which we ourselves are now citizens of. So Lord, may you bless your people with all of the grace to endure any hardship, any suffering, and also to receive the many blessings you give whilst in this life. May we be strong to understand what you have done for us, strong in faith, Lord, to realize we are seeking a city that is to come, that is eternal. Bless your people with faith this morning as they hear this word. Bless them with peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In the mighty name of Jesus, Amen, Amen, and Amen.